Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. This podcast is sponsored by Growing Farmers and Small Farm University. Discover Small Farm University, the ultimate resource for gardeners, homesteaders, and farmers worldwide. SFU offers online, on-demand courses that teach crop growth and profitable farm business management using the unique Ripen method. Learn from experienced farmers and avoid costly mistakes. Highlights of SFU's library include finding the perfect farm property, starting your farm with a one-page business plan, mastering farmer's market success, production techniques like growing greens and tunnel building, and specialized classes such as Elderberry Masterclass. SFU members enjoy access to Growing Farmers Summits, a private Facebook group, and monthly live Q&A sessions for support. Over 100,000 people have attended these annual online events. Join SFU and transform your farming future. Visit growingfarmers.com today. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here with another episode of the Thriving Farmer podcast. And today my guest is Helen Athow, who has worked for 35 years to connect farming, food systems, land stewardship, and conservation. Alongside her late husband, they farmed a 211-acre organic farm in eastern Oregon where they pioneered methods for raising fruit trees without the use of any type of pesticides. Helen has a master's in horticulture and currently farms and does soil building research on her new five-acre farm in western Montana. Tana. She is a contributing writer to the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Pest and Disease Control, and her new book, The Ecological Farm, releases in June. Helen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I am very excited to be here. So tell me, um, you spent 35 years of farming, but you know, way back, what got you into farming? Well, I started farming, well... It, Maybe I'll go from the very beginning when, you know, my mother forced me to garden when I was too young to actually complain about it. But I grew up, I grew up in Western Montana, surrounded by ranchers and ranching. And I, uh, I farmed in return for uh, room and board for me and my horse. So Mm. that's why I got into it. But, uh, but basically what happened is that I, I went back east to college and graduate school, and I worked for an integrated pest management uh, program for the state of New Jersey. And one of my clients, one of my integrated pest management farmers, decided that he wanted to take his 200 acres and 17 crops and go organic in one year. And he wanted Mm -hmm. to hire me to do it. What could go wrong? (laughs) <laughs> and what that was what year was that because that was way before all the modern organic yes, stuff yes that was in the early 80s 1980s mm. and uh boy i learned a lot i scrambled and made mistakes and uh there were there were some tears involved mm. <laughs> for sure uh but i learned so much and then um uh, uh and and we ended up having some really remarkable success and and um uh, we featured in the New York Times as having the best tomatoes in mm. in the city at one point. And so we we continued on. And eventually then in the early 1990s, I was able to start my own farm in Montana. But I guess I'm going to have to give credit to um, to a couple of my early mentors and to uh, this brilliant uh, farmer who decided to go organic in one year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, with that, uh, what would you say were the main things that you struggled with in that that change in one year? Was it the weeds? Was it the pests? It was definitely pests in New Jersey mm-hmm. and and fertility. Although I had I had planned pretty well for fertility and uh, probably uh, did overkill, did a lot of compost, a mm-hmm. lot of mm-hmm. made it made a huge amount of compost and applied quite a bit. Uh, but uh, pest management, we were doing peaches and apples and mm. uh, uh, ten or twelve different vegetable crops and it was a nightmare for pest management. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially on peaches and apples in New Jersey, because there's a lot of that happening there, which meant you guys were getting all the pest pressure. 
Exactly. We were surrounded by orchards. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's fast forward a little bit. And so you farmed an organic farm in Oregon. Um, talk to us about kind of the fruit that production that you're doing there. Yeah, th um, that was when I had finally become brave enough with my late husband to really push the envelope on what we could do ecologically, what we could get away with it. And mm -hmm. I do need to say that by the time we got to Oregon, we were not financially hungry. Mm -hmm. we, we had done very well the previous uh, five years selling, um, selling fruit in the uh, uh, Bay Area, California markets. And so we, we were in a, a relatively lucrative position. Uh -huh. uh, but when I was a kid, we used to tease and say that there were these rich people in the Bitterroot Valley farming with money rather than for money. And we were almost pretty much in that position. So that being said, we were able to take all of our ideas that we've been working on and 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 push them so we did a no-till orchard uh -huh. and um just shockingly to me uh shockingly the trees had a little struggling well the peaches um some of the other varieties cherries apricots apples uh pluots plums mm -hmm. they never struggled but uh the peaches struggled a little the first year and i gave them uh, a little liquid fertilizer boost but everything else had no nitrogen fertilizer mm. except the mowed living mulch. And they came into production rapidly and we had excellent yield and quality. Mm. And uh, um, I, I have to admit, I'm going to work with the new owners because I want to continue to see, will yeah. this, will, yeah, right? Will this system mm -hmm continue to work as well as it's been working or this is the eighth year or is this let's see this will be the ninth year okay. so how how long can we continue this yeah now okay so with those fruit trees now oregon actually is a pretty good fruit growing area correct was that yes it is now uh, we were in eastern oregon mm -hmm. which is a little colder uh but drier uh -huh. than the more traditional fruit growing areas of of western uh yeah oregon. yeah so then with that i mean what would you say the the key system uh i know you talked about a living mulch but what other keys were you doing to uh do without pesticides so what we were doing was maintaining a system that simultaneously built soil and built habitat. So the first key, I, I really believe now in my ancient uh, age that I am, uh, is that we maintain a living root in the soil year round and we have a diversity of, of root architecture and and, and root species so that we can maintain habitat for the greatest microbial community possible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then we continue to regularly, not all at once in the spring, but regularly add residues of different kinds, different uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio residues regularly. So we're constantly feeding the microbial community and we're also not disturbing some of the habitat so that we have sequential bloom and uh, pollen and nectar for beneficial insects, for example, and other beneficial organisms. So it's a matter of maintaining the microbial community, regular decomposition occurring throughout the season, and then maintaining habitat, undisturbed habitat in the orchard as close to the plants as possible. We don't want our beneficial organisms to have to commute to work. We want mm. them to have a place where they can work right next to the crop, where they can live and work together. Okay. So I know like in a lot of fruit orchards, they leave a, a dead strip underneath the trees. And that always uh, irks me because I know it's been done with a Roundup, but 
you're saying that across the entire bottom of your orchard, it was living uh, multi-species cover crop or multi-species perennial uh, polyculture. Absolutely. And and 20 years ago, I wouldn't have believed it possible. Mm -hmm. We were getting a wonderful um, uh, 16 to 24 inches of growth per year with what would look like a lot of competition. So yeah. as, as going back to what I uh, began with managing the carbon to nitrogen ratios of the residues that I add and the regular addition. So when temperatures or just before temperatures started to uh, warm up to above 45 degrees Fahrenheit, for example, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. the soil, to get my microbial community jump started, as soon as the grass would get to be real green, I would take a small um, a side delivery mower and mow right underneath the trees so okay. that we would start with, uh, uh, for, for our system, a higher carbon because it would be green and fresh and succulent grass as opposed mm -hmm. to later in the season, more brown and mm -hmm. drier residue, right? So succulent green residue, maybe in a, in a three foot strip underneath the tree. And I would go down one side of, the tree, of each row one week, and then the next week I would come back and go down the other side. So I was not disturbing. Remember, I'm balancing, managing <laughs> all of the ecological relationships simultaneously. So for habitat, not disturbing one side, but to begin nutrient cycling and, and make the microbial community happy, getting a higher uh, nitrogen residue onto that orchard immediately. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're blowing the, the grass basically towards the row, and then it's just starting to break down in there? It's starting to break down in there, exactly. And you would see uh, a multitude of spiders and carabid beetles and row beetles. And it, so much activity would start with that residue that we added. But then in the row middle, and we went with uh, wider row middles on this or Oregon orchard than we mm -hmm. had uh, previously, uh, because we were growing our own fertilizer and we needed to maintain yeah. air to grow our own fertilizer. So. So in the centers, we would just let it grow and grow and grow, and it would get be really tall. And then a side wonderful benefit of this is that the previous two years, 22 and 21, uh, we had just these terribly hot summers, and they started mm. early. And cherry growers, for example, in Oregon were having trouble with uh, high temperatures and cracking and, and actually burning um, mm. sunburn of fruit. But with this high, you know, four foot at some point, three foot for sure, grass and clover and other flowers uh, in the middle of the, the orchard, we were able with good irrigation, should say had good, good irrigation, yeah. Uh, we were able to maintain humidity and, and a cooling effect. So an unattend, unintended wonderful consequence of this soil and habitat building system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, so then let's talk about some of the common pests out there. So like, I know like the plum, there's a plum beetle or something that's a, a pretty common one. Remind me what that is and like, how did you handle those? A uh, plum curculio, I curculio. think you might yes. be talking about, and um, I wish you hadn't started with that one because darn it, uh, that's not a <laughs> pest that we have in uh, in 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 most of the West, and certainly okay. not in, in Oregon. But let's go to codling moth. Everybody mm -hmm, has mm -hmm. codling moth and apple yes. and oriental fruit moth in peaches are the the worms that you hate to find inside your fruit. And so we had very, very good success, less than 1% uh, damage with oriental fruit moth and varying levels of success with codling moth. Codling moth, uh, some years we had what I would consider economically, uh, economic injury. And, and most years we would have uh, less than 10%, which in our, our system is, is economically sustainable because uh -huh. We have to have some pests in order for the beneficial community of, of biological control organisms to feed. And our, our tithing to ecology is to mm -hmm. allow up to 10% 
injury. So um, what we found is with uh, not disturbing the habitat early on in the season and then allowing sequential bloom so that there was plenty of pollen and nectar that we had the, both the ground dwelling predators and we had the, uh, the predators and parasites that require uh, blooming plants present early in the season. So there was no gap time between when the pest moved in and when the beneficial community was there. Uh huh. Okay. That makes a lot of sense because I think what you see in most orchards is they create this kind of like moonscape. And of course there's no beneficials then um, for the, uh, to be able to, yeah. Interesting. It, it, exactly. And I, I think you've really just hit on something that you can have areas where, where you create habitat for beneficial insects, but if it's not right exact in close proximity to your crops you're going to have those gap times between when the pest arrives and when the beneficials are there to to do mm -hmm. the job so leaving leaving habitat within your farming system is one of my important mm -hmm. ecological principles part of the recipe my late husband and i came up with for managing ecological relationships rather than just simply managing crops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So I want you to, I want, you talked about a recipe there. Is that something you want to dive into a little bit more of that? Or you want, is that something that's in your book and we should discuss it when we need to talk about your book? Uh, it is in the book. It's, it's the, there are, are basically 10 main, uh, main principles that have to do with, with the details of, of reducing tillage, uh, mm -hmm. maintaining an active microbial community, keeping a growing root in or a living root in the soil year round, and then maintaining a diversity of, of root structures and mm -hmm. root, uh, um, uh, diversity of species. Uh, so you have different root exudates, right? Different mm -hmm. biochemicals mm -hmm. being, uh, being put into the soil. All of that in close proximity to the crops that you're growing. So it, it really is kind of a redesign, isn't it, of, mm -hmm. of the traditional farm field. When you look out, uh, you could get up on the hill uh, and look down at our kind of river bottom farm in Oregon. And basically it was hard to tell from a distance where the crops were <laughs> because yeah. everything was green. There was no bare soil. Um, now talk a little bit about what was the end uh, goal of your, with the orchard, what end goal of the product that you were, was it going to retail or wholesale? I have been really lucky. Both my husband and I uh, have been really lucky in that uh, for the last 30 years, uh, we have done mostly direct marketing. So farmer's markets mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, co-ops and restaurants and uh, so that we, we were able to, uh, well, you know, we were able yeah. to get a premium price yeah. and, and be very involved with our, our clients. Mm -hmm. And then I'm assuming because you're able to tell that story of the no pesticides and all of that, that only now allowed people to be very interested in buying your product. Well, and, and I, I don't want to brag, but I'm going to brag. Okay. The reason our fruit had just exquisite taste. And, and I think there are two main reasons. One is the attention to detail. And two is that with this growing of our own fertilizer and having mainly this, this cover crop living mulch plant-based fertilizer system, mm -hmm. we had a slower nutrient release and a, a low a higher carbon lower nitrogen system right mm -hmm. so we we uh, we didn't use high nitrogen compost and we tried to balance the minerals the zinc the boron the manganese as well and potassium and other nutrients as well as as just this focus on nitrogen and the big three nutrients that get a lot of growth so we had a lot of color in our fruit. Uh, mm. Instead of it being kind of yellow with a pink blush, we had some varieties that were 
completely pink and red and, and everything was highly colored. And so we know, of course, highly colored is usually higher in antioxidants and they, they just tasted uh, sweet and complex. So we had really good tasting fruit and, um, and so people bought our fruit because it just tasted better, but they did like the fact that there were no yeah. spring. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that makes sense because, you know, you know, in the, we used to do a lot of strawberries and in the spring, it's always a dance between giving them plenty of water so that they grow, they can, they grow up, but also not giving them too much water so that they just become bland um, and just, you know, basically water balloons. Um, exactly. Yes. So yeah, and we're still working on growing the perfect strawberry and we're not there yet, but we are working on it. Well so, done. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So let's go to, let's talk about, you actually are an, a contributor to, um, the organic gardeners handbook of natural pests and disease control. And is that something that is, comes out, uh, frequently, or is that just a one time, uh, handbook or that's, that was a one time handbook. I'm glad you brought it up. And, uh, I was a contributor to that, uh, about 20 years ago. So, Ooh, how to say this gently. Um, so to me, that's my old thinking. That was when okay. I came out of an integrated pest management background and I hadn't done all the experimentation that I've done for the last 20 years. So one of the reasons actually that I decided to do this book, new book, The Ecological Farm, is that it was really important to me to update that, to mm. update what are the ecological impacts of, of utilizing even certified organic pest management yeah. materials? And uh, boy, the ecological impact is significant in many cases. Mm. Okay, let's break that down a little bit because I'm, you know, we do use some of those things and I always cringe a little bit, but I wanna, so tell me a little bit about some of the kind of the downsides. Yes, yeah, so for example, uh, when we were the last material that we sprayed on our orchard uh, for oriental fruit moth and for codling moth was uh, uh, a microbial insecticide called uh, spinosad or Entrust. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Well familiar with uh, that. Works really, really well, but it also it, it's and it's one of the better ones mm -hmm. in terms of of uh, of beneficial uh, organisms, but it does diminish populations of some beneficial insects. Mm. So we thought, what would happen if we pushed away from that? And for example, what we did is we stopped spraying in trust at bloom or a little after bloom. And for uh, Western flower thrips and for oriental fruit moth on peach, for example. And instead, we let the orchard go ridiculously wild at, at bloom until, oh my goodness, until getting close to harvest, actually. So we wanted to mow then for mm. ease of harvest. But we just let it go crazy underneath the trees. And we saw a proliferation of of beneficial insects and particularly some that we hadn't seen. Mm -hmm. uh, when we stopped spraying, we had a Linnea, we had many different species of spiders in the, in the ground cover, but also in the trees. I have some wonderful photos in the books of, of spiders. In fact, I got a little ridiculous once we started spraying. There were so many different species of spiders that I, I made my pinup calendar of spiders, one mm. spider for every month. So we changed yeah. the, the, the population structure just by removing that one compound. And then the last compound that literally, it's only been a few years uh, that I had the courage to uh, to stop spraying lime sulfur for peach leaf curl disease. Mm. And I thought, well, really, how bad could that be? We spray it during dormant period, right? Yeah. And so it can't be bad. Well, 
I began to study the microbial habitat on the on the leaf tissue, right? We know there's there's um, the soil food web, right? Uh -huh, we know uh -huh. There's the microbial community associated with the, the root. Well, there's also a microbial community community associated with the leaf. And mm. so the lime sulfur that I was spraying affected that microbial community. So what I found was that I would still get some peach leaf curl, but that it it wasn't at, again, that economic level. And I was able to maintain some of the native uh, microbial components on the leaf, like uh, 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 there's an orocidium uh, that actually now has been has been created into a biological control that we found naturally, it's a yeast on our leaves. And when we sprayed uh, things like sul sulfur and copper, it diminished their pop the natural populations of these, these ye this yeast. And when we stopped spraying, they we had higher populations. Okay, interesting. So even the organic, you know, things that we are using are still causing the leaf terrain to change in negative direction. Beautifully uh, summarized. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go dive into your book here a little bit, your new book. Um, you mentioned that kind of basically you wrote it because you're, you kind of had some different thinking and you wanted to kind of lay it all out. I did. I was, uh, uh, an extension agent in, uh, in Western Montana, where I've now returned uh, for about 17 years, and I taught a master gardener class. Mm -hmm. And um, wonderful Montana allowed me to create my own master gardener manual for that uh, course. Uh, and we had an organic master gardener manual, but still, just like the handbook that we were discussing earlier, I was looking at each pest in relation to how can how can we manage it mm. and this new book i look at how do we manage the ecological relationships to create uh, an environment that shifts the balance towards our beneficial microbial and insect and bird and reptile community and away from the the pest mm -hmm. so instead of killing things the new book is looking at ways to suppress organisms that cause damage to crops instead and enhance mm -hmm. the the health of the plant and what i call the immune system of the plant so i spend the first part of the book on on that whole thing and then the second part go through each individual vegetable and fruit crop and and talk about what are the least ecologically impactful methods and and moving up so if you if you have a problem you don't mm -hmm. want to lose lose your crop right you know that <laughs> yes 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 so, so you can move from low impact to moderate impact and then i have heavy impact as well but at least we all know what we're doing instead of just i mean i used to just spray and thought because i was certified organic that it was okay mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it certainly was better it was certainly better yeah but on the scale it's the still there's still a different direction you can go there is and we yeah. we still need to learn more and more and I, uh, I'm so excited. I've been on this new farm about a week <laughs> okay. and, uh, and uh, I still have lots of boxes to unpack, uh, but by golly, the first 20 fruit trees are already in and I've already got the irrigation on my field of alfalfa out yeah. there that, that I'm growing for my fertilizer. So I, I'm excited to have a new place to test these theories and, and again, to just keep going and, and seeing what I can get away with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This podcast is sponsored by Small Farm University, the go-to resource for gardeners, homesteaders, and farmers around the world. 
Small Farm University delivers classes online and on demand with training on how to grow crops and how to grow a profitable farm business that serves you, your family, and your community well. Applying what you learn in SFU could save you thousands of hours and thousands of dollars. And it can save you the agony of costly mistakes some make just because they don't know what they don't know. Delivered by real farmers with hands-on experience and expertise, it is unique in its approach, using the ripened method for growing and building a farm or farm business. Here are a few highlights of what SFU has to offer in its growing library of resources. Find your perfect farm property. Whether you're renting or purchasing, this course guides you through vetting the farm property and determining how or if it suits your business needs. We give you the secret sauce for what makes a profitable farm property and help save you thousands of dollars. Start your farm intensive. Fleshing out your farm idea, craft your one-page business plan, and discover the right funding options for your business. Use our business templates, worksheets, and calculators to figure out the numbers as you go. Farmer's Market Success System. Learn how to attract and convert customers by building an unstoppable marketing and business system for your farmer's markets. Production Mastery Series. Learn all about growing, harvesting, and drying greens. Learn about tunnel building and take special classes such as brand new and very popular Elderberry Masterclass. We include real-life examples and calculators for figuring out fertility rates, how much money you are actually making, and where your profit is coming from. Business Systems and Marketing Courses. Learn about the SFU Ripen Formula for Success, develop your marketing plan, and join in for behind-the-scenes tours of real farm businesses. Learn the systems you need to run your business well and how to hire a team to help you. And learn how you can add value to what you produce to generate even more income with minimal additional time and expense. In addition, members of SFU get access to the Growing Farmer Summits on demand with over 100 sessions of targeted areas of interest to farmers. These annual online events have attracted over 100,000 people from around the world, and they are included in your SFU membership as a bonus. SFU membership includes access to a private member group, monthly group Q&A sessions, and even one-on-one coaching sessions where you can get your questions answered and find the support you need. To learn more, visit growingfarmers.com today. All right, so one of the problem crops we have is cucumbers, and particularly cucumber beetles. Uh, Talk to me a little bit about that. Do you have experience with that one? I do, Uh, not as much because cucumber beetles with this system that we have, have have not been too problematic. Mm. And part of that, I think, uh, has to do with uh, some of the uh, reduced tillage uh, mm-hmm. systems, uh, but but also creating habitat. So for example, um, uh, I have these, I'm gonna come back to spiders again. I have great mm-hmm. pictures of spider webs uh, all over the cucurbits uh, because we are, um, we are blowing living mulch into the cucurbit habitat. And with our mm-hmm. cucumbers, um, um, unlike the other cucurbits, a winter squash, for example, we are uh, growing them on trellises. And so they're up off the ground. Mm-hmm. But, um, but basically, um, we, we just haven't seen uh, as big a population of cucumber beetles once we started regularly adding that mulch to the root system of the cucurbits. And I, th- I think what's going on is, is um, multifaceted that number one, the, you know, short, shallow rooted cucurbits actually like that mulch. Themselves. Yeah. So they're growing stronger and, and we are creating a, a habitat for um, uh, predators particularly to then um, diminish or suppress the population of the cucumber beetles. Okay, gotcha. But I do need to tell you that I don't have those big expanses of bare soil that bring in things like flea beetles and cucumber uh, beetles that, that, that can, can migrate in. Okay, does, so- does that make sense? Okay, so I'm gonna stop you there because I'm a little, I'm a little bit gonna tease a little more out here. Okay, big expanses of of raw soil or just bare soil that increases the production of these pests. I think the reason that we have avoided uh, migrating beetle pests like cucumber beetles and like uh, flea beetles is that we have a complex landscape. Mm so that we don't have a lot of bare soil and uh, a large field 
in one crop like cucumbers or or winter squash so that when the beetles start to move in they can move in rapidly and find their specific host rapidly mm. so i think i think again it's it's a suppression and they move in more slowly and as they move in slowly the beneficial insects that we have within the mulch system and within the 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 habitat of the living mulch are able to maintain them at an economic level if they were moving in more rapidly or in higher population numbers perhaps my predator populations would become overwhelmed gotcha okay and um this living mulch with all the spiders and stuff is a main deterrent of those because i'm assuming the spiders would go after the cucumber beetle uh, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, there's a particular spider, uh, the wolf spider, uh -huh. uh, that uh, uh, takes out um, um, uh, squash bugs and cucumber beetles. Awesome, because we have a lot of wolf spiders around, so that's, that's a good thing to see. Go. Yes. So, so you just need to make your wolf spiders happier. Yes. Okay. All right. That's on my to-do list today is make wolf spiders happier. Very good. <laughs> Um, all right, so talk to us a little bit about what else is in this book that you're that's coming out here, and uh, I think in June you said. In June, yes. Well, uh, basically, I start with, I I try to make a case for farming with a systems approach rather than the way I started farming, and probably many of us started farming, which is figuring out which crops you're going to grow and what the needs of that crop are and what the mm. pests of that crop are and just being crop centric or focused entirely on that crop. Now I'd like us to have a more diffuse view of the whole whole farm and, and try and design it for both soil and habitat building and preferably design systems in which all those functions are happening simultaneously. So the first part of the book is making a case for, for a systems approach mm -hmm. and then going into ridiculous, and I apologize for my scientific nerdiness, but a detailed approach to how, how you manage a soil system and what I call an organic matter system. Okay. And I spend a, a lot of um, time on that because I think the details really matter. I think when you, when you look at different, different systems for creating a, a, a of soil fertility that that you need to know all the details and you need to know how it's going to affect your microbial uh, community and 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 how again you can shift that the balance of your microbial community towards away from disease or microbes and towards nutrient cycling and mycorrhizae and you know what does it take to make mycorrhizae happy and what does it take to mm -hmm. i used to think how to make earthworms happy 15 20 years ago and now it's all about how to make mycorrhizae happy so lots of nerdy detail and then i move into habitat building and what do we mean by creating habitat for particular beneficial microorganisms and how they all interact. Mm -hmm. That's all the first part of the book. And then I move into my farmer hat that, that needs to make money and needs to actually get things to farmer's market fast and early and uh, in beautiful quality. And I have a section on fruit production and vegetable production so that you have the strongest crops you can. You, you build the immune system of each of your fruit crops and each of your vegetable crops. And then a troubleshooting, problem solving guide. I go through the main pests, kind of like the handbook, by the way, that you mentioned, the, um, uh, the Rodale book. Uh -huh. I go through all of the different uh, pests for each crop. And then give what I consider the least impact, moderate impact to high impact, ecological impact, uh, pest management alternatives so that you can at least start with suppressing. And if you do have to move towards 
actually killing pests, that you can do it in a way that will be the least ecological impact and you can eventually bring the system back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so you mentioned habitat. Is there anything in particular habitat that you recommend folks start with? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think that the first thing to think about is that what is it that your beneficial organisms need. So let's let's think about beneficial insects. Let's think about predators. What they need is uh, a food source, a, a place to overwinter, and a place to reproduce. So they need undisturbed habitat as close to your crop as possible. So that could be a beetle bank, for example, a grassy area right next to your crop, or uh, it could be an insect strip, a flower strip gro growing through your crop. So, and then once you've got overwintering habitat, so an area, for example, that would be in cover crop that you don't disturb all winter, mm. and that's, that's right there as soon as you put your crops in in the spring, and then, and then habitat near the crops, and then habitat that's undisturbed, at least some habitat, in some part of the field that gets to bloom and is, is undisturbed through the whole season. Mm -hmm. So that you have uh, sequential sources of pollen and nectar throughout the season. So start with that. Overwintering mm -hmm. site, undisturbed overwintering, uh, undisturbed areas as close to crops as possible and sequential bloom throughout the season. And then you become more advanced and you look at what plants have the best pollen and the best nectar for specific beneficial insects. And I spend a lot of time in the, in the book on that, which are the best plants to, to actually encourage on your, in, in your garden or on your farm and, and why. Mm -hmm. But at least in the beginning, think about undisturbed habitat mm -hmm. and sequential bloom. Yes, yes. We have a lot of... Um intentionally planted perennial uh, hedgerows in the farm, but um, right now there are willows and elderberries and a few other things, but I need to get more sequential blooming. So I'm super excited to read the book. Well, anything else you'd like to share with us before we go? Boy, I'm just so thrilled that you are helping young farmers because I think what I want to share is that I am still learning after 40 years of doing this and what other career can you say that about that mm -hmm. I have aha moments still every day, but not only me, I think when I go to farmers markets that suddenly people are more and more interested in the quality of their food and the quality of their environment and balancing food production and allowing other organisms like birds, like insects, like I know some people don't like, but snakes. Yes. Right? How can we as humans eat well, stay healthy and maintain a healthy environment too? So thank you for helping young farmers think about all these things. Oh, well, thank you for coming on. And the book is available through Chelsea Green. It's called The Ecological Farm, a minimum a minimalistic no-till, no-spray, selective weeding, grow your own fertilizer system for organic agriculture. Um, and you said it is release date is June 8th, but you can pre-order now. So super excited for that book coming out. I will definitely be getting myself a copy. And Helen, it was a pleasure speaking with you and uh, learning about your systems and uh, how you're making it all work. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.